Uh, but George V. Cook tried to run me out. Uh, and the way they have it in the summer is they have two men between their junior and senior year that take care of a little family of 39 pleas. And so George V. Cook and Nat Pace uh, were in charge of me, and both were going to be in the Marine Corps. And uh, it's sort of funny because George Cook really didn't like me at all. He was trying his hardest to get me to fail. Uh, in fact, one, and they, they're physically abusive back then. Then in 1976, they let women into the Naval Academy. Uh, and suddenly, the physical abuse was less. But George Cook was so abusive to me, physically hazing me, that one night I went to the, uh, the evening formation, which was at 6.30 p.m. every night, and I'm out there in the stone courtyard in front of Bancroft Hall, and I passed out. And suddenly, George Cook had one of those holy whatever moments, because he knew why I passed out, and he didn't know if I hit my head on the ground. And it's stolen. Oh, yeah, but I, I think someone must have caught me on my way down. But, you know, he really was trying to get me to fail. And I do respect him for it because he was a former enlisted Marine. And he didn't think anything about me reminded him of the Marine Corps. But I wasn't in the Marine Corps yet. And he didn't know I wanted to be. But later on, he had a, a little bit of a his turn in the barrel when I graduated and went to the Marine Corps. Now we're both in the same Marine Corps. And he thinks I shouldn't be a Marine. Well, maybe I shouldn't have been, but if I hadn't been, I wouldn't have gone to the Air National Guard. I wouldn't have gone to the airline. I wouldn't have been in a position because I was an air defense fighter pilot of understanding, looking with trained vision to make, uh, there's a physical estimates of speed, altitude, angle of bank, nose, pitch up or down. And, you know, I got that training in the Air Force when I was flying F-4s and F-16s, so in the morning of 9-11, and I'm not talking about 10 minutes after the first airplane hit, uh, immediately after the second airplane hit, and some people are going to stop right now and say, I thought you said they were drones. Yeah, they are, but a drone is simply an airplane with no pilots. But uh, because of my air defense background, I could tell that these aircraft were not being flown by airline pilots, and I could tell because I could tell the speed. And I could tell the speed based on the body angle because a 727 going 230 knots has its nose up like this, and it probably should be cruising at around uh, maybe 310 knots, and its nose is like that. But if it's going 350 knots, its nose would be down. But if anyone goes back and look at the uh, drone that was United 175 body angle, it was like this, so it was going about 350, which is illegal. Because under 10,000 feet in the United States of America, you can't go more than 250. So I knew when I watched United 175's drone replacement. Let's see who this is. <laughs> Just a minute. Hey, Cole, I'm on a live radio show. Can I call you back? Okay, bye-bye. Uh, some people say, Field, that's really unprofessional. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it does prove one thing. We're totally unscripted, spontaneous, reactive, and yet polite. Uh, that's my son, and I can talk to him later. But anyway, where were we? Oh, yes, okay. body angle. So, so I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. So how is speed and angle, how does that relate to your thinking about what happened in regards to they're already going to crash the plane, so who cares whether it's legal or illegal? That's not my point. Right. My point is, it proved to me there was zero doubt in my mind. And did I ever tell you that the Fargo Forum came out to my house for an interview early in the afternoon on 9-11? And my yes, opinion? you did. Yeah. And so somebody valued my opinion, and my opinion was well set within an hour of seeing this. Mm -hmm. Because I, I absolutely knew two things. And there's nobody in the world that wants to argue on either of these. Right. And if they do, they're going to lose. I knew that armed hijackers could not force a United America, Delta, uh, Northwest, Continental. You're not going to force a guy to go 350 miles, 350 knots. And by the legend of the mainstream media, these were some pretty bad pilots that were very young. And so 
they, they couldn't have handled the airplane. And once again, there's a reason why I say this, mm -hmm. and it's critical. The reason I say these young 23 Muslim men could not handle an airplane going 350 knots is not one of those guys had ever been above 10,000 feet in the simulators where they were trained. So if they've never flown above 10,000 feet, they never would have, in fact, uh, a uh, FAA inspector and an FBI agent got together and they started talking about one of the guys, I think it's, no, it's not Mohammed Adda, I'd have to check. I can picture him, but I've forgotten his name. One of the guys was being trained at Northwest Airlines and the FAA guy and a Northwest instructor got a hold of an FBI lady named uh, Colleen Rowley, R-O-W-L-E-Y. And they said, uh, Colleen, there's something really odd going on at Northwest. We've got a guy who's being trained in the 757 or 767. Same difference, really, just right. And he doesn't want to go above 10,000 feet. So I already, because of my position, not because it's not smarts, it's nothing else. God put me in the position of working at Northwest Airlines, which I never should have either because they wouldn't hire me. But I went to North Central Republic and then I got merged in the Northwest. And on my way to Delta, which I never turned a wheel for, I learned firsthand about this conversation. And so that lady, Colleen Rowley, she blew the whistle on 9-11 and they made it uncomfortable for her. And I think she quit soon thereafter or retired. See, they, they've been trying to cover up 9-11 from the point forward where United 93 went down at Shanksville because right there they failed. But I knew three things. Uh, you couldn't force pilots for an established American airline to break that rule because most of them were too chicken to do it. Now, have I ever broke the rule? Uh, yeah, I'm not too chicken to do it. And rules don't really mean a lot of beans, but safety does. And a good example is if you're out of fuel and you're, you're trying to get somewhere, if you goof up the approach when you're flamed out, meaning the engines aren't turning, you might have to stick your nose down to get to the airport before you overfly it and crash. There's times when you can go faster. You can do anything you want in an airliner if the captain of the airliner declares an emergency. At that point, all the rules go out the window. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but anyway, uh, couldn't it be the American pilots wouldn't do it? Low time pilots that were only trained up to 10,000 feet, you can't go more than 250 until you go above 10,000 feet. So they couldn't, it's not like a bicycle completely, but it is sort of, picture yourself on a bicycle going downhill. At the top of the hill and you're going 10, you could do a pretty hard turn and not tip over. If your chain slips, like it did to me once when I was 13, uh, and you're going down the hill with no coaster brake, and you're accelerating and accelerating and accelerating, you try turning now and you're gonna do just what I did. You're gonna go a little bit to the left and then you're gonna go over the handlebars. And uh, so there's lessons in life you can learn at an early age that helps you prepare to take care of uh, less than uh, less than wonderful things. So, like for instance, uh, most pilot. This is going to sound critical. I hope it, I hope nobody judges me for it. But a lot of people want to be pilots because they think it's a big deal or they think it pays well. Um, and a lot of those guys are never happy and they're never comfortable because they're doing something for the wrong reason. But people that, and I'm sure this is true of people that are doctors, lawyers, uh, mafia dons, house painters. If you like what you do for a living, you'll never work another day in your life. And uh, I liked what I did, but it was simply because it was my dad's job. He right. flew airplanes full of bombs. I flew airplanes full of people. people. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question. I want to back up for a minute. Okay. You made a statement in regards to that Northwest would have never hired you. They wouldn't. What was the difference in criteria between Delta and... and Delta wouldn't hire me either. Okay. Who was it that you flew for prior to Northwest? Uh, well, the, I, in 1978, I was hired by North Central Airlines. And this is... And its nickname was the Little Delta. In other words, they were as well thought out for a small airline as Delta always has been for a large airline. Okay. I, I applied to Delta and I didn't even get a response. And I think it's because 
when I was in the Navy flying TA-4s at NAS, get a load of this, NAS Chase Field. Yeah, so there's another God thing. Um, I was strapping into my airplane once, and the crew, the crew chief or plane captain, uh, who was helping me put my torso harness on, mm -hmm. he was a kid, probably 23 or 24, and he said, what are you on? And I said, uh, I'm on a formation flight for those three students over in those three airplanes. He said, no, 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 that's not my question. What are you on? And I said, I don't understand the question. He says, are you taking something? And I said, yeah, I, I abuse coffee. I've been drinking coffee all morning, but are you suggesting something else? He said, yeah, I thought maybe you had some good drugs that you might be willing to share. I said, you know, I get this all the time, but no, it's natural energy. And I told the guy, uh, here comes another God thing. So if you don't like God things, go get a glass of water. I told the guy, no, my mother had it, and I've always had it, and it's natural. And I said, that's where if I have an energized or fast-paced uh, behavior, it's quite natural. And I said, I wouldn't be able to be in this career path if I use drugs. And uh, that's why in my generation, San Francisco and hippies and all that fun stuff, I missed out on it because I I wanted to be a pilot like my dad. Right. I didn't I didn't want to lose that opportunity. Um, the God thing, this young man who was very kind to me and he respected me a lot, his father did the hiring at Delta Airlines back in 1978. He says, are you going to stay in the Marine Corps or get out? And I said, well, the Marine Corps would probably like me to get out. I'd like to stay in. They have more power, so eventually I'll probably get out. He says, if you ever get out, and he wrote me down his dad's name. And we didn't have email back then. But phone number and the address of the hiring office at Delta. And he says, if you ever get out and want to fly for a good airline, here's my dad's name. He does the hiring at Delta. Delta didn't hire me. <laughs> they probably didn't like that I wrote to the head of hiring. They probably thought that's, and I agree with him. That's not the way I should have done it. But, you know, I was only 25. Right. The young man who suggested it was probably 23 and you know we didn't know what the world was all about then so yeah they wouldn't hire me uh, American wouldn't hire me United wouldn't hire me and yet God got me hired at exactly the right airline because North Central turned into Republic which turned into Northwest and all the time I could live 200 mm, 240 miles away in Fargo and fly for the Air National Guard so it was a very nice combination of jobs that I never should have gotten either one of them. And uh, strangely enough, when I did get hired by North Central, about a year later, after I was off probation, which means they really got to have a reason to can you then, uh, I happened to be flying a 727 trip with a guy who hired me, whose name was Rhett Thompson. And I said, we're cruising, you know, so we don't have to be paying attention. I said, hey, Rhett, I got a serious question. In fact, just to demonstrate my recall, the engineer was Jeff Baird from Fargo, and I was Field McConnell from Fargo, and he was Rhett Thompson, who lived in Minneapolis and had a home in Florida. I said, I said, Rhett, you hired me, and I got a serious question. He said, yeah, what's that? I said, why in the world did you hire me? And he said, that's a good question, and I'll tell you exactly why. He said, when we were told to get a class ready, uh, there were 5,000 applications on file. He said, myself and a couple of other senior pilots went through the 5,000 and we whittled them down to 800. And then we, because men like to take credit for the work while women do it all, then we gave the 800 to a lady named Karen Dampier, uh, who was from Bismarck, North Dakota, but she worked in the general office. And Karen Dampier was tasked with whittling 800 down to 14 and calling those 14. And, and he, he said, but I did, do something in your case. He said, I thought your uh, background was so unusual for a 27 year old. I wanted to at least meet you. And if I didn't like you, I wouldn't have hired you. But I found your story so interesting that, you know, I hired you. And so far you're doing fine, aren't you? I said, yeah, I'm off probation. And uh, that's another thing that shouldn't have worked. But, you know, strangely enough, and I got to be serious. And well, everything I've said is honest, but I got to be really, really serious in case there's some young people. Uh, you know, you can. You should work hard and try to achieve what it is your goals are. You should try to stay away from anything that would lessen your chances of getting the job you'd like. Uh, but then there's other cases like me where 
no matter what you do, God knows where he wants you. And he wanted me somewhere on 9-11. And that turned into wanting me on Malaysia 370. Uh, I think you know this, but when I went to Malaysia, I actually predicted, well, you do know it, because we were being on the valley together. I think so, I know that. Yeah, God prepared me for something. And uh, now it's gone from airplanes to global pedophilia as the mechanism of controlling our governments. And uh, my sister is one of the people that not only got controlled by pedophilia, but now she projects it right here in the Pierce County Courthouse on the 14th of August, excuse me, 21st of August of 2014. I was in the jury box and the judge says, do any of you 12 jurors have a personal relationship with pedophilia? I raised my hand and he said, he looked at his cheat sheet, you know, they don't know who you are. He looks at his cheat sheet and he sees that the guy sitting in that seat is Field McConnell. So he said, Mr. McConnell, you have a personal relationship with pedophilia? And I said, yes, judge, not your honor, no honor, they're dishonorable. Uh, yes, judge, my sister and Hillary Clinton run the largest net centric pedophile network in the entire world. The judge put his hands over his ears, said TMI. He might have said too much information, but it was one of the two. And then he said, you're excused. And I didn't crack a smile, but I was laughing on the inside because I got it on the record and I got out of court. I didn't, you know, I, I would have, if I thought this guy was guilty of what he was accused of, accused of, which was an improper relationship with an adolescent stepdaughter, I would have voted to hang him in the highest yard arm. But I, I know how courts are, and unfortunately I'm accurate. And well, by the way, what's your opinion of courts? Do you have a website that... Uh, I happen to have a website called ipissedoffanattorney.com. It, uh, in the next couple of days, you can also put in politicals.com. It's P-E-L-I-T-I-C-A-L-S. Um, dot com, and it uh, yeah it we our 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 uh, position there is just it's not about being rude to attorneys or disrespecting attorneys it's disrespecting lousy attorneys, um, and there are a few good attorneys we can probably count them on our two hands but. I know at least two very good attorneys out in New England, uh, and one of them is a Christian Jew, and one of them is a Christian Catholic. Those are the two good attorneys I'm aware of, mm -hmm. but uh, they're so good, and let's not give any more details, either right, you or me, right. but anyway, so, there are good attorneys. So we're going to back up here for a minute because we're a little bit off track. But what I want to do is I want to go yeah. back to Annapolis. I don't want to go back to Annapolis. I know you don't, but I think everybody out here wants to hear some things that uh, we might talk about about Annapolis. Um, you spent four years there, correct? Yes, I did. And, and in that, if I might call it internship at Annapolis, um, is that where you learned more about flying or is that where you picked up learning how to fly no that was a, a that was an education that was mostly science and math but it led to a bs degree and then uh depending on your class rank and i was ranked number 530 out of 800 and something maybe 860 i got that at my home in fact what i'll do is i'll go i'll go look it up when i get home because i've got the register that's how I know that John McCain was ranked 893. That's how I know his father was in the class in 1931. And that's how I know his uh, grandfather was in the class of 1906. And all three of those, uh, three different generations, three different McCains, all have been related somehow to treason or intentional damage to Navy property. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I, sometimes I get tired of talking about all these things I'm connected to because people would think what a raging egotist you know he thinks he's really done something let me go on the record and say I haven't done anything God's done it uh, I have a part to play and on the on the uh, sixth of excuse me on the fourth of December of 2006 at 335 p.m 
in the afternoon on US Highway 10, uh, God asked me to expose evil. And uh, that's what I do. And I just, just to show you how the global reach of evil danger is, when I gave you that last hand signal, Mary, it was the guy in Norway who previously wasn't picking this up. He's, he put up a link about the speaking opportunity I had on May 20th of this year, where Denise and I went to Horwood House in Bletchley Park, Milton Keynes area of the UK. And I spoke for 75 minutes on the issue of pedophilia. And I told the host, I said, you know, I really don't wish to speak on pedophilia, but I said, I don't think anybody else does either. So I'll do it. And uh, you've seen that YouTube, haven't you? Yes, I yeah, because have. it's not released to the public. Oh, well, they can buy it right now, but it'll it'll be free. And uh, I'm just hoping our country hangs together until that pedophilia thing comes out, because I link all the global leaders to pedophilia, which is accurate. Uh, the royals, and of course you can't be royals because the only royalty that exists is Jesus. But there's people that think they're royal. Well, if royal means you marry your consort and then you create pregnancies with people like uh, King Juan Carlos of Spain uh, or Lord Porchester, uh, these guys, they're not at the high end of the food chain, royal. I think they're more likely excrement. But mm -hmm. let's not go there for now. It's, uh, you okay. keep me on track. That's a challenge. Let's, it, well, it can be. Um, and I'm sure anybody out there watching uh, would understand that a little bit. So we're going to get back into your athleticism. You told me a few stories of, uh, let's just say, your, your expertise at uh, um, track and field. Well, it's appropriate because my name isn't track, but my name is field. Yes, I was the uh, second slowest guy in the class of 1971 at the Naval Academy. And you know, you know how men are, uh, and adolescent men and young men, they're very competitive, and they like to make rude and hurting comments about people who are not athletic. So uh, I was so slow. And remember, there's over 1,300 people in my class. They identified myself and a guy named Owen Jenkins as the two slowest guys out of 1,300 plus. And so in order to try to break our will or humiliate us, they said, okay, all you other plebes can take a break. We want Owen Jenkins and Field McConnell at the goal line, and we're going to run to the opposite goal line and back and see which one of them is slower. And I, to myself, and I was only 17, I thought this is really poor leadership and it's nothing about building up confidence or morale. So when they uh, gave us our shotgun start, we both took off like a pair of turtles. <laughs> and uh, and I actually, I something happened that never happened to me before. I couldn't see Owen. And I thought, usually the other runners are clearly visible to me. And I said, I don't see Owen. So I cautiously, I, I don't like to, I, I wouldn't say run, I'd say, uh, waddle quickly. So I was waddling quickly and I looked over my right shoulder and Owen's back there about 10 or 12 feet. And I thought, well, he must be crushed. So I slowed up, let him pass me. And and so he won the race. He was the, he was the second slowest guy. And according to the record, I was the slowest guy in my class. Well, actually, God took care of that too, because uh, Owen either flunked out or got forced out. And so when he left the Naval Academy class 71, I was now the slowest guy in the class. But that's okay. Some people are made to be tennis players. Some people are made to be football stars. And some people are made to expose evil. So God knew what he was doing. And sometimes I get teary-eyed thinking about he's, how he sustained me when so many other people are trying to get rid of me. I guess it just shows you that God wins. And that's going to be true of the United States of America, I am confident. That doesn't mean I'm right. But uh, I know who the enemies of America are, and uh, they're not that easy to put fear into. And I, uh, I'm quite certain my sister has, and I'm not going to say this on here, I'll tell you later why I, I know. My sister is suddenly uh, wondering, is she going to be able to control me or not? And I think the answer is not. And I place, I place myself in the hands of God, because uh, I'm willing to die for 
Americans and innocent victims, especially victims of pedophilia. I'd die right now if I could prevent one pedophile attack, but it might not be efficient use of my death because uh, my I've got the number of pedophile victims a year, and I think it's 27 million. So if I were to die right now to protect a seven-year-old girl or a four-year-old boy, uh, I couldn't press on with the battle, but I'm going to press on. And Proverbs 21.31 says, the horse, or in this case, the horse is rear, but the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests on the Lord. So my question to all you royals and you elitists, uh, do you think you're going to get away with controlling the world much longer with pedophilia just because you've been doing that ever since the time of the Greek and Roman uh, empires? And uh, you can, based on history, you can say, yeah, we'll probably get away with it. Uh, well, you know, you can read your history books. In fact, you can change your history books. In fact, there's something called revisionist history, but you can't change the future because that belongs to God. That's true. So... Give me some ideas of, of some of the people that you went to school with that were close to you in Annapolis. Close friends? Yeah. Uh, John McCorkle, he was my roommate who um, went on to, well, he, sadly, he left uh, because of academic issues in February of 1969. And uh, he wanted to serve America, so he joined the Army, and they thought he had leadership skills, which, of course, you get pretty quick at Annapolis. Right. So he joined the Army uh, as an infantry guy in the uh, first air cab. I don't know what that means, but it means you walk around the woods with 13 men. It's called patrolling. Mm -hmm. And uh, one morning, he was the first lieutenant, and one morning he took his 12 men out for a walk through the woods, and they went... A, B, C, D, E, back to A. And that afternoon, another patrol from his unit went out for a walk in the woods, jungle actually, and they went A, B, C, D, E. And probably what they were doing is patrolling a perimeter or some uh, land they wanted to protect. Well, the second patrol walked into an ambush. And I got goosebumps right now. And uh, if John McCorkle hears this, and I'll make sure he does. He's a Christian pastor right now in Illinois, and he he felt so bad. It's called survivor's guilt. John McCorkle felt so bad that when he got out of the Army, the only way he could address his survivor guilt was by becoming an alcoholic, which he was for 28 years. But he's a born-again Christian pastor right now. And you've heard me talk about a possibility of a ranch in Texas. Mm -hmm. I got a phone call this morning that indicated that the party who would be involved in funding that ranch is still extremely confident. And people like John McCorkle, uh, I would reach out to him. He's got a Christian organization of Army veterans uh, called, I think it's called, I can't believe my memory some days, Point Man Ministries. Do either of you know what a point man is? In the infantry. Explain. It's the guy that's at the front of the column. There's 13 people in line, single file. The two most dangerous positions are the point man and the guy at the rear. Mm -hmm. Because they'll either shoot you first on the way in, <clears throat> or they'll shoot the other guy in the back on the way out. And this goes back to John McCorkle. He uh, was saved by God. And how did God save him? <clears throat> well, perhaps God saved him by causing whoever scheduled to have him scheduled for the early walk in the woods instead of a late one. or And the, the reason he knows the ambush was there and they walked through it is because the other team moved at night. And so they would have moved into that position at night and the patrol went through it in the daylight. So they walked right through an ambush and he didn't get shot. So I think I can speak firmly for John McCorkle right now that he knows not only that he owes his life to God, period, but that he could work every day for the rest of his life and he could never could pay God back for that favor. Yes. That's why he feels guilty. And uh, if we get the ranch, he'll get an email from me. In fact, he's going to get one here in a couple hours because I want him to hear this. The other roommate, he and I had a third, there was me, uh, 
And even though in my dog tags it said I was Protestant, which would infer Christian, uh, I was not a Christian. I just was. I was a Christian by default, like most of America. I wasn't a Hindu, I wasn't a Buddhist, I wasn't a Muslim, an agnostic, atheist. So I was a Christian by default. But the other two guys were Christians. John McCorkle, who uh, you know, spent 28 years in a stupor and now has been a Christian pastor for 20 years or so. Uh, the other guy was Craig McFarland from Salina, Kansas, who was not only a born again Christian, but he drove me nuts because he had a really beyond baritone bass voice. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to sing a little tribute to him. But first, I got to say that he was a um, aerospace engineer, which means uh, he's very, very smart. But he is also very, very devout and quite boring. <laughs> we had all the bases covered in that room. Uh, but anyway, sometimes he'd break in to an Eddie Arnold or a Jim Reeves song, and he had darn near a bass voice. And so sometimes John and I would be trying to study, which neither one of us were good at, and John proved it by being eliminated academically. And uh, But sometimes the three of us would be sitting there at night, and he'd break into a hymn like, On a hill far away is an old rugged cross. And John and I would make fun of him, and throw things out, shut up, you know. But anyway, uh, I had the sad experience of hearing about my roommate, uh, Craig McFarland, dying in a crash at Lamar, California, in November of 1974. And there's a whole lot more to that story that I could share, but I, I just want to hit the high points. And I was known as the biggest Santa Claus in my training squadron, which means I gave up. I had the second highest grades on base. The only guy that gave out higher grades than me was the wing commander, Puff O'Gara. Uh, and I could go there too. I hope somebody's writing down where we can go when we get to Texas and tell all these stories because they're all true. But I heard that my friend and roommate had died in a plane crash. A very good student came up to me, very good gamesmanship too, because he knew I had the highest grades. Uh, he said, sir, I hate that. We're all equal. There's no sirs, but it's okay. He said, sir, is there any chance that you could go on a uh, cross country to San Francisco and we'll go to Alameda Naval Air Station? Are you busy this weekend? And I was a bachelor then. Uh, and I said, no, I'm not busy and I love to go cross country. I said, could we, um, could you do me a favor though? If, if you get graded very fairly? He says, no, that's the reason I'm asking you. He said, yeah, what do you want? I said, do you mind if we make one instrument approach into NAS Lamar, California, and then when we go missed approach, you fly us to San Francisco? He said, that'd be great. And uh, in some ways, I wish I hadn't said that because he flew a nice instrument approach on a very clear day. And I could see the scorched earth where my born again Christian superior pilot and superior intellect died at age 25. So we got one guy walking through an ambush, a second guy dying at age 25. And I'm the only one left out of that group of three. I mean, John McCorkle's still alive, but his, his life sure went a direction other than the way he would have hoped. And so did Craig's. Uh, and so has mine. But I would just caution my sister, George H.W. Bush, uh, Theresa May, John McCain. I'm not dead yet, and there's a reason why. And maybe it's I'm supposed to pursue you guys until you are. Next question. So we had uh, the three musketeers. Yep, McCorkle, McFarland, and McConnell. And we were all met. That's how we ended up together. It, I was... Uh, Seven one five six five six. Did you go alphabetical? Yes, and we all had six number digits, and we were all like three little peas in a pod, and we're all different personalities. And I've got some really good campfire stories about life in that room, but it would be after the um, the people that have to go to bed before like ten or eleven o'clock. Well, when they're away from the bonfire, we'll, we'll get into some other stories that are. 
I'm laughing just thinking about uh, John McCorkle doing jumping jacks. I'll leave it at that. So when you were at Annapolis, yep. was there drinking involved there at all? Uh, officially not. Um, Craig McFarland had, he went to a church off base and he had a guy who was a good friend of his at the church that volunteered to get, now first of all, I literally never had a drop of anything before I went there. But then of course you're trying to fit into a pack mentality. And so Craig McFarland, who is milk toast and Christian, his friend who's there, I can picture him, I can't remember his name was. He said, do you guys want any uh, booze to go to the Army-Navy football game? And Craig said, let me ask my roommates. And so John McCorkle and I said, yeah, well, that'd be great because we're going to a party. You don't want to go into a party without a survival kit. Uh, but neither John McCorkle or I knew anything about alcohol. And so we told McFarland, we said, what does your friend recommend? He says, oh, my friend recommends it recommend scotch and we said yeah we've heard of that so we either got a I couldn't tell you the difference between a quarter or a fifth but we got one or the other John McCorkle and I mm -hmm. and so we thought after the Army Navy football game in December of 67 we thought well maybe we should get our nerve up for this party so we split a bottle of scotch as two teetotalers yeah the party started around eight as I recall by about 6 30 there were two young 18-year-old kids in adjoining stalls in a bathroom wishing they'd never brought the scotch to the Army-Navy football game. Now, I've got a lot more stories, and they're all good, but and they're all did, true, but we don't have that much time. Did you ever make it to the party? No. Nope. Neither one of us. The party did. was over. Yeah. Yeah. Turn out the lights, the party's over. Or turn out your lights, and the party will go yeah. on. But anyway, we survived that, and we learned something from it. I learned I never wanted to drink scotch again. <laughs> what is this up on the wall? Oh, that's rye whiskey. But see, everyone in the chat room, uh, or actually even people that aren't in the chat room, everyone knows this is a gift from a guy in Canada up around... Uh, uh, a little has bit. it ever been open? No, it's you. Right. You tell I me. See, well, no, I see that. I've had it for two years. Uh -huh. Somebody, in fact, he stayed. He stayed at your B and B. The guy from up. Oh yes, yeah, another god thing. Um, I forgot his name, but he gave Mary, me. You can remember. And he worked. Was that with the railroad or? He I went, think he had worked at the railroad. Yeah, he went to a conference. Mm -hmm. For solar wind, it was an energy or sustainable went to two energy conference. One that way and one that way. Yeah, yeah. And very and, interesting, very nice man. Yeah, very nice and um, it would be very gracious. But see, I now you may have an opinion whether I ever have a sip or not. But there's proof right there that oh that there are some bottles that don't get open. Right. Yeah, there's right. one of them. Very few, but now that, how do you think that makes me feel? <laughs> but uh, that's going to get open down at the ranch, and it's going to get open at the ranch if David Hawkins is there for the wow. opening. That would be and amazing. David wouldn't like that stuff. You know, I, I wouldn't like it either. But I might have a thimbleful, right? Just, you know, as the grand opening, and then we go out and have a bonfire. And, uh, we if we have a bonfire at the ranch, I hope uh, Cookie Monster in Illinois. Notice I didn't say her real name, Carrie Cocos, because that's, you know, so I call her Cookie Monster. I've never met her. But uh, she's probably writing furious notes about stories to start. And uh, we'd probably be up until the sun came up. But some of the stories are sad, like Craig McFarland dying at age 25. It gets yeah. sadder yet when you find out that his wife had just uh, filed for divorce. And his wife, at age 25, and his wife was a civilian employee of the Naval Air Station Lemoore, and she worked as an air traffic controller, and she was on duty the night he drove into the ground in Little Rock. Boy. Now, I'm just thinking that she might have had a little pinch of guilt because the Navy aviation safety circles have uh, ranked every bad thing that can happen to you and the worst thing that can happen to you, the very worst thing is having a child predecease you. 
and they'll ground you for a long time. But the second worst thing is having a spouse leave, yeah. and he should have been grounded. He shouldn't have been flying. Right. But it, you know, I'm not sure on the timing, but she may have just filed that day or the day before. They may not have known about it. Yeah. So you know, but yeah, I, I, uh, I respected Craig. And now I told you he was sort of milk toast. He was, but he was an extremely honorable and uh, honest and intelligent Christian guy. And uh, sometimes, you, you know, it looks like from us, our standpoint, sometimes God takes the wrong one. You know, why didn't you take him? There's nothing wrong with him. And that's, I think myself and John McCorkle both feel that way, you know? Right. So anyway. So now that we've established that Field did not go to Annapolis on an athletic scholarship, um, when, did you decide that you wanted to fly? You know, I, I, I know you probably wanted to fly since you were a child, but when you got into Annapolis and what gave you the opportunity to learn to be a pilot? Well, first of all, you have to have an adequate rank in the class standing. And so I know mine was 530. I don't remember how many we graduated. I will look it up and I'll add it to the uh, chat room notes and I'll put it in the radio show ad too, but um, you you can actually, depending on the needs of the service, that's always the overriding thing. If they need a lot of pilots or if they need a lot of ship drivers, uh, they won't fudge on some things. They won't fudge on uh, nuclear submarines or nuclear power. Mm -hmm. It doesn't care what the needs of the service are. If you're not bright enough, you're not going. Uh, that's one exception. Uh, SEALs. Uh, S-E-A-L-S. -E My class was either the first or second class to allow SEALs to come right out of the academy. Now, you'd have to be a pretty good athlete, but you'd also have to be, you know, have a pretty good behavior record. Uh, and there's, you asked me about people from my class. Well, I'll tell you two right now. Uh, everyone's heard of uh, Captain Francis Chick Burlington. He was yeah. the captain of American 77 on 9-11, which, um, the Looney Tunes people in our government, which is really not our government, by the way. The Organic Act of 1871 created a corporation. Uh, and as long as we're going down that short road, right now today, it's my firm belief that President Trump is the president of the corporation. And unbeknownst to most people, General Joseph Dunford is the president of the Constitutional Republic, which may well reemerge. And if it doesn't reemerge, uh, people can point and say, Field, you're nuts. Uh, you don't know how many times I've heard that over the course of my life, and it just rolls off my back. But I do think our country is going to be saved. I think it's going to be saved by some very good people uh, behind the scenes. And uh, five Marines, three of which are Dunford, Mattis, and Kelly. And the fifth one is a guy named Ailes, A I L E S. And then there's a fourth one out there somewhere. We really don't know where he is. Right. Yeah. Oh, I didn't tell you. I said seal. There's a guy. Yeah. yeah a guy in my class named Albert Schaufelberger Jr. He was assassinated as a seal in 1983. And I never can get this right. If it's Nicaragua or Honduras. There's another one that sounds like Nicaragua, but. Anyway, uh, some of America's enemies shot him at close range, uh, and so he's dead. He's the first guy to die out of some special operators in the class of 71. Chick Burlingame was the next, and the reason they needed to kill Chick Burlingame is because he's the guy who was a war gamer. Uh, he flew for American as a captain, but he was still in the Navy Reserves, and he wrote the exercise called Amalgam Virgo 01, and they knew that they were going to take that exercise and go rogue with it. And who's they? Well, the United States Senior Executive Service, Serco, the largest corporation you've never heard of. If you take a look at today's radio show app, there's a picture of me standing at Serco's front door. Um, and Denise took the picture. And guess what, Serco? We're coming back. Thursday of next week, I think she and I will be at the Crooked Billet, which is a wonderful restaurant pub. And I've already published it. I've sent it right to Trump and to Dunford. 
uh, it's in one paragraph at the bottom of one of those David Hawkins letters. Mm -hmm. It says that I've got some stuff I got to get over to England to take care of, and I'm going to be meeting two informants at the Crooked Billet at 11:57 in the morning on Thursday of this week. And I'm going to be meeting a single person, not meaning I'm married, just one person, uh, at the bar in the Glippe's house in uh, Crick Howell, Wales, at 1711, which is 5 p.m., on the 4th of September. I could be day off. It is 1711, but it might be the 3rd of September. It's one of those two days. And uh, I want to be very clear about how much respect I have for my wife because this type of activity would scare a lot of women if their husband was doing it. Mm -hmm. Not Denise. She's, she's a real trooper. And uh, she only found me. She found me. I didn't find her, but I'm glad God, God did that. Uh, she found me because she had an intense interest in Malaysia 370 when it went down on uh, March 8th of 2014. And so every time she Googled MH370, my name came up, and I'm not exaggerating. She said, I wonder who this guy is. So she sniffed around, you know, on the Internet, and she found out that I do these radio shows. She started listening to it. In fact, we got, I'm going to check in a minute when I quiet, which could be hours. But there's, there's two people for sure that know what I'm going to tell you is true, and there might be a third one. But I was doing a radio show right here. Probably in, uh, well, no, I can give you it now, probably. In January of 2015, I looked right into this camera like I'm going to look right now. Hello, Denise. Hello, McDime. Hello, Vanishing Point. And uh, I looked right into the camera, and I said, oh, by the way, for our people in the United Kingdom, I'm going over to Telford, United Kingdom, to speak on the weekend of 27 February to 2 March. Uh, and so I know how to get to Heathrow. But I don't even know where Telford is. So if any of you guys in the chat room uh, know where Telford is, could you tell me if it's best to get a bus, a train, a taxi, a regional jet flight, or how's the best way to get to Telford? And boom, boom, boom. Uh, Doug McNichol. Oh, sorry, Doug. I meant McDime. Uh, Agent McDime and uh, Agent Dice and Vanishing Point, all three said, I can pick you up and take you to that conference. And one of those three, which is Agent Dice, said, I can pick you up. And I was going to that conference anyway. Now, there's two good reasons to liaise with Agent Dice. Because I wrote some fiction that was a little bit questionable, but it was also very lethal and accurate and effective. So I thought, well, if I was writing fiction about this trip, I don't want to ride with two guys. I want to ride with a female because if nothing else, it makes better fiction. Sure. And so I said uh, to Agent Dice in the chat room, if, if you're willing to drive me up there, I sure appreciate it. She said, oh, I'm willing. And then after I got off the radio, I did just what every other male, well, every other heterosexual male, any age, never you never get over it. I asked a pastor, and you know who it is, but let's not name him. I was talking to an 83-year-old Christian pastor there that was a mentor. To my would, that, would that be five? What did I just say? I said, don't mention him. Did oh. you Did you hear that? It doesn't matter. I didn't mention him. No, I know you didn't. They, <laughs> they did it with technology. Yeah, Pastor Clyde died uh, several months ago. And, uh, you know, I'm sort of soft-hearted. And I went to his memorial service, and I couldn't stay. I saw some friends I hadn't seen for a year or two. And they said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to get out of here before I start crying. And you know what? Strangely, they were respectful of that because I'd shown up for his family and then I exited. But yeah, I was talking to Pastor Clyde one day, and I would, this is when I was writing some of the interesting stuff I wrote, mm -hmm. which reminds me, Denise, I've already published that you and I are going to get War Bride done by October. So I, I hope we can do that. Uh, War Bride's a book. Denise asked me to write a book, a truthful book about she and I. Mm -hmm. So it is, I'm in, I'm in to three or four chapters, but then when Denise left on December 13th and never came back, I just, I refused to write until she's back with me or I'm with her. Right. You know, I don't get paid for writing. It's, I, the stuff I write, I was going to say, I wish I had one of the books down here. Guess what? 
I'm going to go get a book and I'm going to read you the last page of the third book and show you how I'm effectively putting my head right on the chopping block and then telling the bad guys, uh, I'm at 401 Main Street. Come on. Yeah, cowards. Let me read it. Do you mind if I read it? It's just one page. Right. No, not at all. And this is funny because this book, which is the third book, it's called Lemon Squeeze, which uh, in slang over in the UK, lemon squeeze means urinate, male or female. But this is an example of how, uh, I guess you could say aggressive, I am in exposing names. Good afternoon to those at the table, to those in San Diego, Quantico, Fargo, Bletchley Park, as well as here in Portsmouth. Uh, Umbrella Man has seen a deterioration of conditions in the Kuwaiti Diner Resale War, and for that reason, he is now terminating Operation Lemon Squeeze at 1711 Zulu. Did you pick up on what time that was, 1711? Do you remember what time I'm going to be at the bar at Goethe's house? 1711? Yes. Uh, are you feeling me? Okay. Anyway, Lemon Squeeze at 1711 Zulu, this date, Sunday, 10 March, 1991. Uh, travel arrangements have been made as we now deploy into uptick Operation Warbread. <laughs> I just, see, I told you that was going to be the fourth book. I really, I didn't read, I don't read my own books. It's hard enough writing them. Um, if that isn't evoked, well, it's been evoked, hasn't it, because I'm writing it. I will now go once around the table to introduce the speakers, and we'll ask each one one question. Please hold any questions until the denouement, finale, final scene, epilogue, coda, end, ending, finish, close, or the climax. Huh, isn't English a great language? And if anybody is choking on Climax, that was the name of the group that did Precious and Few in 72. Our speakers will be Tillman. Now, you know who Tillman is, don't you? I do. Yeah, notice I didn't say Craig Peterson. You didn't. No, I did not. No. Our speakers will be and Tillman. I didn't either. No, and neither did the silent voice over there. Right. Which reminds me, have you ever seen the video we did? With Denise and I in it. I did. The quiet lady. I think yeah. I'll add that to you. She was the quiet lady as oh, well. I swear. And that was totally unscripted. Whereas these boneheads trying to destroy our collective countries, they script everything, including the Charlottesville attack. But let me get back. Our speakers will be Tillman briefing Arrow Air 1285 murders, Jarhead briefing the Sabo murder, Data briefing USS Iowa murders, Barry M. Hall. Now, you might have forgotten Bucky Badger's code name. Oh, no. No, okay. Barry M. Hall briefing the Kuwaiti Diner Reset murders and upcoming murders of Saddam and his half-brother. Agent Dice to brief the upcoming false flag in Las Vegas. And for the uh, grand finale, Agent Afterburner will close us with her view of the upcoming second Pearl Harbor, which is scheduled for the time frame 20 January 99 to 20 July uh, 2002. Let me just say what that was. That's 9-11. But sometimes when you read a lot of information, it goes over your head. But first, a group question for those six speakers. Regarding the murders of Arrow Air, USS Iowa, Colonel Sabo, U.S. Marine Corps, Kuwait, Las Vegas, and the second Pearl Harbor, if one human could be blamed, who might that be? Hands, please. So I'm asking these six people to raise their hands when they get an answer. A chorus of respondents raised their hands and replied in one voice, George H. W. Bush, as the sound of thunder or artillery fire interrupting, interrupted the briefing, prohibiting a strong finish. That's pretty direct, and it's been in print for a year and a half. So uh, these guys, I've I got to show you the cover. Craig Peterson did this cover, and it's excellent. Um, uh, Craig, you're a master at what you do. Thanks for working with us. And then my wife, Denise, took that picture. She didn't have much to work with, but we're not afraid to show our face. Whereas those that we pursue on behalf of God, uh, they, they sort of fail to show up. In fact, uh, I would think I would be very foolish to say that I might be on flight, uh, Delta flight 10 tomorrow, leaving Minneapolis at 10.04 p.m. going to Terminal 3 at Heathrow, arriving at 12.15 p.m. the following day. So I hope that doesn't somehow get onto this. 
because not only could customs uh, interrupt my travel, but so could the Boeing uninterruptible autopilot or FADAC. Well, that's unless there's ways to block FADAC and be UAP. So the people around the world that are trying to destroy humanity and violate children, you just have to ask yourself, do you feel lucky? 30 Harry was great. Okay, next question. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, let's move on from Annapolis. Okay, good. I didn't like it there anyway. Yeah. I picked up on that just a little bit. Except you apparently got through it. Yeah. You weren't a tremendous student there, as you claim. Uh, no, I was not. But you got through it, and then you became a better student. What happened? Well, I, I'd never been challenged from kindergarten through my junior year in high school. And because I was never challenged, I was never interested. And when you're not interested, you don't do well. Like I had a, a solid C minus average going into Punahou. And at Punahou, I had a B average. And the only difference is Punahou is a very good school and they stimulate you and if, academically. Um, and I had the good fortune, if you want to call it that, it's not good fortune at all, it's God. But I had an English teacher whose name was Barbara Earl, E-R-E-A-R-L-E. -E -E. And uh, we were only allowed to take one elective each of the semesters of my senior year. And I took creative writing. And uh, Barbara Earl thought I could write pretty well. Uh, and I, I didn't think I could write very well, but I, I've always liked challenging stuff. And there was a real, I, I had to go through three different words before I got a clean one. There was a real nerd who was snobby that thought he was the second incarnation of Bob Dylan. So he wrote, he wrote uh, poems. They weren't poems at all. They were random words, no meaning. But he probably was taking drugs because a lot of people at Punahou would have been then because they're all from wealthy families, except for military kids like me. But this guy's name was Richard, uh, as a courtesy to Mr. Philbon, I'm not going to mention his last name, but his first name was Richard and his last name started with a P, you know, like Pissan. Uh, he made it very clear he intended, he was in my class, Drew mm -hmm. right? He made it very clear he intended to win the poetry contest that year. And I... I wrote down on my little piece of paper, poem. Uh, we'll speed this up. And I've got it. No, I don't have it here, but I have it on my desk at home. It says Winner Poetry Award. And uh, it was not Richard P. We'll leave it at that. But uh, here's another thing. So you were a poet, you just didn't know it? But my feet show it because they're long poems. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, when I got to Annapolis, I'm marching around, and when we march around, you're supposed to keep your eyes in the boat, which means you're both, nah, nah, nah. eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Anyway, uh, you have to do cadences. And so we're marching around doing our little cadence in the summer. It probably was July of 67. And as, as we're marching by some civilians over here, uh, I hear, Field, is that you? And so I was new at the Naval Academy. I didn't. I didn't know you couldn't respond to people that recognize you. So I looked to my right. Hi, Mrs. Earl. It was my English teacher at Annapolis. And she and her daughter, Jane Earl, were do they're doing something. And Jane Earl also ended up a, a career teacher at Puno. And a twist, if everybody's getting bored, I'll just give you something not to be bored with. Uh, do you remember any politician that went to my high school? Puno? It seems like there was a B.O. Yeah, B-H-O, and I'm not talking about Bachman Turner over there, that's B-T-O. Yeah. But B-H-O, when he was registered at Punahou in the class of 67, his name was Barry Swatero, and he, he was registered as an Indonesian Muslim. Well, when I was registered there, I was registered as Field McConnell, U.S. Christian. And once again, I wasn't a Christian, but my parents forced me to go to a Protestant church, so I got classified as a Christian. Um, I don't like the fact that this guy who's a total imposter and i didn't say anything about being a mulatto or a gay male prostitute or a drug abuser or a person married their guy of the other of the same gender those things don't matter i just don't like somebody trying to destroy the united states of america and i don't care who they are you know if it's hillary clinton george hw bush john mccain they're they're all uh my enemy but what's really important if you take a look at 
Watch this. Watch this. Would somebody in the chat room put up uh, Hebrews 10? Hebrews 10, uh, it's either 25, 26, or 26 and 27. And uh, what it says is, if we deliberately keep on sinning after knowledge of the truth, and there is no hope left other than for a uh, eternity in fire, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, e expectation. Ex expectation of a fiery something. Uh, and before we quit, maybe I can read that correctly. But somebody's going to, no, I don't have to read it. I've got 200-year-old plus Bibles in here, both from England. But somebody's going to, and I'm not asking, I just know the chat room. Somebody's already found Hebrews 10, 26, and 27. And if it's here now, I'll just yes, read it. It is, it is here. Uh, thank you, Cookie Monster. For if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. A different version says the enemies of God. Let me just rattle off the five first ones that pop into my head. My sister, Christine Marcy, George H.W. Bush, John McCain, Theresa May, and uh, Ed Heath. I got a, two people from England in there. I like to be fair. I could, I, should, I could hit up some other countries too. But all you guys that are, and the only thing that you guys have in common is you've been blackmailed, extorted, and entrapped by pedophile acts. And, uh, you know, God knows that. It's not going unnoticed. It's not going unpunished. I know there's people around the world right now listening that say, well, when's going to when is God going to do it? That's up to God, isn't it? Let's go back to Proverbs twenty one thirty one. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests on the Lord. He's going to take care of it. Mark my words. So, um, we've gotten to a point now where you. At what point did you go to the National Guard? Well, I graduated from Annapolis on 9 June 71. I went in the Marine Corps until the 1st of May of 77. And when my commanding officer, Commander McGowan, ranked me nine out of nine Marines, I walked into his office and I said, uh, I don't really like being ranked nine out of nine when I do more of the product here, which is fly hours of training. Mm -hmm. I said, not only am I a scheduler, so I know who's getting the hours, but I'm the guy that flies more flights for you, more hours of training than anybody else in the squadron. So whatever your reason is for putting me ninth out of nine, I said, before you articulate that to me in naval jargon, would you please call the chief across the hangar, uh, the chief of administration, and tell him to process my resignation papers? Because I'm quitting. I'm not going to put up with this brand of leadership. That guy, he was surprised. There were more people that got surprised by my brand, my brand of leadership. You should know your job. You should do your job. Right. But if somebody's working hard and he's producing more of the product than anybody else, and I'm just talking about the nine Marine instructors. I wasn't judged against the Navy guys. But uh, I worked really hard. Now, i got to be honest, it was really fun. So it's a lot easier to work hard when you have fun doing it. But it still takes hours away from other things that you know young men like might like to be doing. So going back to a question that I asked earlier that we really never got to the uh, uh, answer to is, where did you learn how to fly? Well, first I learned from my father at Ramey Air Force Base in Puerto Rico in 1964 because I did a science project where we got an Cessna 172 and we took a bunch of bleach bottles out over the ocean and we threw them out of the airplane. Each bottle had a note from one of the each kid in Mr. Shaw's science class, and I had to think for what his name is. I think it was James Shaw. He was a born-again Christian. He graduated from Washita uh, University or College down in Arkansas. He was a very good science teacher, a very nice man. Uh, he had two kids on either side of me in high school that were really good kids, really smart kids. But, you know, whenever I had to come up with a science project, I liked doing something off the wall that was enjoyable. So I said to my dad, hey, can you take me five or 10 miles out over the Caribbean so I can throw all these bleach bottles out? And then there's notes signed by each of us students. This is a science project. 
if if you open this and you find the note and you read English, would you please mail me a letter and tell me where you found it? And that's what we did. Now, let's go, that was 1964, let's go to 2010. Uh, over that same body of water, which would have been uh, north, north of Ramey Air Force Base in Aguadilla, Puerto Rico, uh, in January of 2010, there was, a, there was an earthquake mm -hmm. in Haiti. And the aircraft that was involved in that earthquake is right over there. Did I show you the picture the other day, the U-2? Yeah, yeah it's a U-2-80-1076. Um, and strangely enough, that same U-2-80-1076 was involved in Katrina. And in both cases, in Haiti and in Katrina, they were killing blacks. And let me stop and say black lives matter. And so do white lives, red lives, yellow lives. You know, we all matter equally. You know, whenever you guys are done, I'm done. No, <laughs> no I don't, it doesn't matter to me. But uh, it's interesting to note that the Clinton Foundation uh, was active in both places. Uh, they were active in Haiti in uh, organ harvesting and child trafficking. Uh, and uh, hey, Hillary, how are you liking this so far? Uh, and in Katrina, they were trying to kill black people just to kill them because they're black. Now, Procter & Gamble thought that was a really good idea. Uh, back when uh, Sanger, I don't remember her first name, but uh, somebody in the chat room will put it up, watch it. Mm -hmm. uh, this Sanger lady back in 1936-1937 at the Procter & Gamble company that everybody knows, she said what we should do is find uh, some type of a pharmaceutical that kill black people. Well, yeah, and so, you know, I've been sort of active in veterans affairs, uh, and I, well, I, I've i really honored Pat Tillman by publishing the truth about who assassinated and, and how, and that was uh, in April of 2004, I think. Somebody in the chat room will put up the, I think it was, I get it mixed up with Extortion 17. Somebody up there already? Margaret. Margaret Sanger, yeah. yeah. And guess what? Hillary Clinton said, Margaret Sanger is one of my heroines. Okay, now so you got Hillary Clinton and her foundation killing black people uh, for profit. And then she admits that Margaret Sanger was a heroic woman. Well, of course, Margaret Sanger wanted to kill black people. So what did I do with that? Well, after I sort of got tired of watching white people kill black people or black people kill white people or San Francisco fire trucks driving over Chinese girls, I sprang into action. And uh, <laughs> well, I didn't spring, I slowly got up and my back creaked. No, I, I, I was asked in 2006 to expose evil and I'd do it and I can prove it because every belt buckle over there says expose evil and you got belt buckle 69 so you know what I'm talking about. I do. Denise has belt buckle 49, Craig Peterson has 65 and I got six. Um, so anyway, I, the first time I ever controlled it, no, that's not true. I just thought of another one. In October of 58, I was in a Northwest Airlines Boeing Stratocruiser. Now, what was that? I recognize, oh, it's, it's this. So let's see what that is. Somebody uh, sent you a message. Yeah, and I'll get it when you take over. But in October of 58, I flew with my mother and my sister uh, from Tampa to Chicago and from Chicago to Bismarck. And on the return voyage, and it's called a Boeing 377 Stratocruiser, which is the civilian model of what the Air Force called the KC-97 Stratotanker. Um, anyway, the flight attendant, one of the flight attendants there, and we were up at the front of the airplane, so maybe we were in first class. If, if we were, I guarantee you we didn't pay for it because my parents were fairly thrifty. But uh, my mother must have talked to a flight attendant, and uh, they didn't call him flight attendant then, they called stewardess. Uh, right. But she said, your son, your, this little eight-year-old kid, looks like he's very interested in this airplane. She said, well, yeah, his father is a pilot. And she said, well, do you think your son would like to go up in the cockpit? And my mother, who's just like me, which is not a compliment always, but you know, she was, uh, well, there's your picture up there. You can see what a nice lady she was. Yeah. My mother said, I'm sure it would mean the world to him if he could go up and just see what the cockpit looks like. So she took me up in the cockpit. I got put on the co-pilot's lap. I'm not making this up. 
I hadn't been up there a minute, and my mom felt the airplane go right and left. <laughs> so they had taken the autopilot off and said, why didn't you steer the airplane? So I went, <laughs> and so that was in October 58. And isn't it ironic that I had ended up working for Northwest Airlines after not being hired by Northwest Airlines, and I'd be retired from Delta Airlines after never working a day for Delta Airlines. So the complexity of my life, and, and all lives are complex, just like all lives matter. But the only reason, I first of all, I'm me, so I know more about my life than, than yours. But um, there's no human that can arrange all this stuff. And it's, it's interesting to be part of, and it's got to be threatening to the people that are the enemies of God. Because uh, even though I'm not qualified to do most of what I've done, uh, you know, I keep chugging along. And I will not voluntarily quit until I'm dead. Now, there's people as recently as last night, a guy in Michigan named Bob Simpson said, Field, I'm really happy you're going to get us to go spend a month with your wife. And I said, yeah, so am I. And he said, maybe you could slow up a little. And I said, Bob, <laughs> Bob, I appreciate the thought, but it isn't going to happen, so I'm not going to lie to you. But I, I can be equally productive, but a whole lot more comfortable if Denise is four feet away, and she has a little woodshed in her backyard, and uh, she's been spending most of every day out in that woodshed doing woodworking, and uh, and I go out there too. It's fun to be in her woodshed, and then she has a little patio where we can sit in chairs and just talk or watch the garden. I like to watch. She has a very nice garden. Uh, I like to watch the bees because she has a uh, they're called wildflowers. Mm -hmm. And they attract hundreds of bees, and they don't sting me. That's what I really like about them. Do they ever get near beer? I'm trying to think of. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to defer to Denise. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I, when I go over there to the UK, uh, I always enjoy a Filipino beer called something. Uh, I can't remember right now. But no, I don't recall ever having a, a, a bee. In a beer, I'm not even sure I drink beer over there. I do up in the kitchen, which is Operation Hot Kitchen. Uh, but uh, I did. You triggered another random thought from about 1961. I was out in my backyard at uh, South Hadley, Massachusetts, and I blew, blew a big bubble of bubble gum, and then I sucked it back in. Remember how you did that when you were a kid? Mm, there's something in there besides bubble gum, and it was a bee. Oh, uh, I, I. Once I realized there was something moving in my bubble gun, I went, and out it went. <laughs> uh, but it didn't sting me. So anyway, that's my story about whatever you ask me. But see, if you asked me what color my shoes were, I'd start off by saying they're brown, and then 30 minutes later, I would have solved the uh, theory of relativity. And people would say, well, I really like his information, but I wish he wouldn't talk like that. Well, you might as well wish for pigs to fly. That's not happening very soon, is it? I don't think so, but just there's a picture of me with velvety ears on uh, because Denise asked me, which reminds me, Denise asked me to make sure I bring about 250 postcards or whatever I have over to England. Um, and just so Denise, and it's getting late for her, so she should go to bed soon. But um, this is where Denise and I met. I mean, we met at the airport. But two hours after we were at the airport, we were in Telford, and these are all uh, cards from Telford that I'm taking over to Nace. And as long as I'm taking those, I'm going to take these cards, which, yeah, it says Operation Belvedere somewhere. This one says Operation Crowbar. Because, and I, this stuff about these operations, I do that to uh, mimic, to satire, or humiliate. In the government, because right now we have a uh, a military exercise just about ready to start up. If it hasn't started up, about a rolling blackout due to an EMP attack, mm -hmm. and this is right on the heels of Korea uh, rattling their saber. Right. And um, I'm I'm not political because I'm very fair. I hate all politicians, but when it comes to Trump, he's not a politician. He's a businessman, and he hasn't. The military term is bite on chaff. Or he hasn't taken the bait. Because there's been a couple times where, and one of them being when a ship intentionally rammed the USS Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. a lot of presidents would have launched an attack, you know, 
let's not take time to figure out who did it. Let's just attack a lot of people. And North Korea would have been one of those parties because on the Fitzgerald, both the super tanker that's registered in the Philippines, um, but it was owned somewhere else, and I think it was Korea, but it doesn't matter what I think. Uh, both the super tanker and the Fitzgerald were being remotely controlled. And there's some people in the world that know I know a little bit about droning up aircraft. Uh, and that's simply because in around November of 1961, I got a model of an AGM-128 Hound Dog cruise missile because my dad flew B-52s. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't control that. But, uh, yeah, I know something about 9-11. I know something about Malaysia 370. I know something about Malaysia 17. And, in fact, I predicted that, as you well know. Yeah. But... Uh, uh, what we have there is we got the same people, and uh, I don't want to say Circo's doing it by themselves, so I'll say the United States Senior Executive Service, which 95% of the people listening had never heard of. So just Google it. Search for United States Senior Executive Service. My sister started that in 1979 after President Jimmy Carter, who was a draft dodger at Annapolis in the Class 47. In 1978, he asked my sister to... Uh, create this senior executive service, which is all about treason and weakening in America. So we got Circo, the United States Senior Executive Service, the Crown Agents in England, and the Jesuit Order at the Vatican. And uh, they all played a part in 9-11, and uh, they all should be looking forward to Hebrews 10, 26, and 27. And that, yet they all have a free will, and uh, I'll pick my sister. If she would uh, turn away from her evil ways and seek his face, he'd forgive her. But some of these people, they think they're so guilty and they're so timid, they just can't bring themselves to ask God to forgive them. Well, if you'd get some big girl pants on, Chris, and get on your knees by yourself when nobody's around and spill your guts to God, he will hear you and he will forgive you. So, one final question. Okay, great. What do you know about helicopters? Well, I know that uh, sometimes they crash. Uh, I have, uh, in fact, watch this. I know a helicopter pilot who was the armory officer at Tustin Helicopter Base in uh, Southern California in the time frame of the early 80s. And if that helicopter pilot wants to call me right now, I'll put him on the speakerphone and we'll ask him what I know. He can ask me questions about helicopters. I never flew in a helicopter. But uh, he may not call, but uh, I'm quite certain he's listening to this radio show. But uh, helicopters that I know a little bit about is an RAF Chinook that was uh, destroyed in 1990, uh, 1994 at Mole Kintyre, Scotland. And what they had to do, and they 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 uh, took the power away from the engines of the helicopter. They don't fly real well with it. I mean, you can land them safely by auto rotating, but they needed to kill some very high senior intelligence people from the royal military because they'd been over doing some work with the uh, bad people in Northern Ireland, and they know too much. Just like Chick Burlington, he knew too much, so they killed him. American seventy seven, but they didn't kill him at the Pentagon. Okay, let's fast forward to uh, 2013, a police helicopter, Clutha, C-L-U-T-H-A, and that's a pub in Glasgow, Scotland. That was going into a hover. There was some type of police activity targeting that pub, and they went into a hover over the top of the bar, and uh, it uh, lost power in both engines and it crashed through the ceiling of the Clotha pub. And one of those sets of initials that I sent in today's radio show Ed, is the, su the son of the man who was in charge of the helicopter who died at the Clotha. Then another helicopter event I'm very articulate with, and it involves talking to parents of Aaron Carson Vaughn, the SEAL right here in this room. Uh, but when Extortion 17 was taken down under the orders of our own president, uh, in fact, let's give credit where credit due. Here's the five people in the chain of command that I'm aware of. I'm sure there's more. Uh, Obama, who's really Barry Sotero, was the uh, illegitimate commander-in-chief. Uh, Leon Panetta was the secretary of defense. Uh, West Point graduate from the class of 74. Martin Dempsey was the 
chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, a three-star general who I've not identified by name, but his military call sign is Golf G, capital G, 87, diagonal OPIE, OPI. And then there was a guy who, on the night they killed 38 men and a dog, including Aaron Carson Vaughn, uh, the SEALs that didn't get Osama bin Laden, because Osama bin Laden died in 2001 uh, of renal failure, I think, but he's dead. But they had to, uh, Obama, I think, timed it because there was a royal wedding and he wanted to upstage the royals. Mm -hmm. So they, they uh, claimed they killed uh, Osama bin Laden, but they didn't. Uh, but now they had to kill the SEALs. And that's why Extortion 17 was taken down. And uh, that was taken down with uh, what appeared to be three rocket-propelled grenades, uh, one going below the helicopter, one flying through the rear rotor, taking off 14 feet of one rotor blade, which throws it out of control. Uh, and it was at an altitude of 125 feet AGO. And then the third RPG, which is a rocket-propelled grenade, but when the rocket motor is firing, it's fired. So everybody can see this. And so they think that some bad guys took the helicopter down. Nope, the United States military government, the people in our own government, and I rattled them off. They start with Obama and they end with Thomas Rickard. Uh, all that RPG stuff is just eye candy. Uh, just like on 9-11, the two Boeing drones hitting the towers, that's just eye candy, so they can blame it on patsies. They blamed it on 23 Muslims on 9-11. And they blamed it on terror, uh, not terrorists, but uh, disloyal Afghanis on extortion 17. But it, it always goes back to the same people. Let's rattle them off again. Uh, the Jesuit Order of the Vatican, the Crown Agents of the United Kingdom, the Circle in the United Kingdom, and the United States Senior Executive Service, which I refer to as Treason Inc. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? No. Okay, what was the question? The question was in regards to one of our uh, people in the chat room had asked a question about the most recent helicopter. Uh, yeah, it's Charlottesville. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that was probably, a, well, the whole thing was a false flag, I'm quite certain. And if uh, anybody from the government wants to argue that on, on this radio show right now, my number is 715-307-8222. And you're welcome to call me and I'll point out it was a Bell 407. And it's uh, got FADEX, which means full authority digital engine control. So I'm going to use you as a guinea pig. It has, it has full authority digital engine control. The helicopter has that, right? Mm -hmm. So here's a question that you cannot anticipate. If the helicopter itself has full authority digital engine control, is it even academically possible that the pilot could have full control of the engine? No. Yeah, if you got it, I mean, you're right. So what they've done, they've privatized war, they've privatized murder. Uh, the two helicopter pilots in the Bell 407 that crashed yesterday, um, their widows probably can be found by able to enter. And uh, I would be willing to fly out there and talk to them or talk to them at length on the telephone just like you remember Billy and Karen Vaughn, right? Mm -hmm. They came here in uh, 2014 because they wanted me to explain to them how their son was murdered. And I did. And that's one of the hardest things I've ever done is I sat them down in that room over there. There was Billy and Karen, myself, and somebody else who you're used to know. And I said, well, I'm not sure I can solve this for you, but if you start out and take turns, because you're going to choke up, but if you start from the time the helicopter took off till the time it came out of the sky, I might be able to shed some light on this. So they took turns, and um, it was Karen that was talking, and she said the helicopter got up to 125 feet, and then there were three RPGs. One went through the rear rotor and took off 14 feet of one blade, and then the airplane tumbled to the ground. Now, key thing, 125 feet. So I said, Karen, it really hurts me to have to ask you this, but what was the condition of the bodies of those 38 men and a dog when the first responders got there? She said, soup. That's exactly what she said. And, and I was moved. I get moved a lot. 
I have people move out a lot too. But anyway, we'll be on the bright side of this. Karen said they were soup. And I said, are you telling me that those 38 men and the dog were liquefied? She said, yes. And I said, well, I, I know what happened then. Because you're not going to get liquefied from 125 feet. Right. We had just suffered that Malaysia uh, 17 deal where they came out of the 30s and the bodies weren't liquefied. Right. They were intact. So I said, I know how they did it. And she said, and she and Billy were both, you know, they, I think they felt pending relief because nobody in the military told them how these guys died. I said, they, they couldn't have died because of the aircraft falling from 125 feet. But you told me, Karen and Billy, that right before the helicopter lifted off, seven Afghani um, troops that were on the aircraft got out and seven replacement Afghani troops got on. I said, did I hear you right, Billy and Karen? They said, yep. I said, well, I can tell you how they did it then. Uh, the, the second group of Afghani embedded troops, when they got on, they were wearing flak jackets, body armor, and they thought, and they, they wouldn't have known what they were doing. They would have got on and they would have been provided body armor. And I said, I said all those body armor protective devices were filled with uh, some explosive, could be smack sonic, uh, could be, but anyway, when the, when the second RPG went through the rotor blades so the people doing this could be assured of the destruction of the helicopter, they detonated the explosives and that turned these 38 men and a dog named Bart to soup. And for those people who participated in the planning of that, which are Obama, uh, Leon Panetta, Martin Dempsey, G87 OP, or Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Rickard, uh, you didn't get away with it. And don't go back to the drawing board. Get down on your knees and beg forgiveness. And I'm not sure if you can forgive forgiven that, but uh, I, I have no reason to believe you can't. But uh, otherwise, you got a pure, fiery expectation. And that led me to one more thing about the that helicopter and the intentional destruction of it. But uh, anyway, they, Billy and Karen were very happy, and, and and I think they believed me to be totally correct. Mm -hmm. But you, if anybody wants to volunteer, like if there's somebody that doesn't like my rambling way of talking, uh, just go up in a helicopter at 125 feet and jump out. And uh, then take a selfie of yourself, and if you're liquid, you'll change your mind. And if you're just plain dead, you won't. Okay, was that our last question, or do you have more? That's it. Okay. And we have been on now for... One hour and 45 minutes and 44 seconds. Yeah. Yep. I think we're going to wrap it up for this Sunday chat. Okay. Um, you've been here with Field McConnell and... Phil Roberts, Agent Chips and Agent RPM, coming to you from Plum City, Wisconsin, the control room of uh, Able Danger. I knew I'd remember. <laughs> so, until next time, we'll be doing this again. We're not always exactly sure of our schedule. Field's going to be uh, uh, on active duty in England, and um, we are going to try to do this either by Skype or some other means while he is gone, so we will keep you all posted. We appreciate you coming and, and sitting with us on this Sunday. Have a great uh, rest of the evening, and we'll talk to you again soon. Goodbye. Did anybody post the red button? Oh, thank you. Yeah, if somebody gets gets me the red button and the proper protocol, they've yeah. got to give me the secret code, which is three two one push it, or is it one two three push it? No, it's three two one push it. Oh, we're getting good comments here. Uh, no to the mark, and, and I'm just going to read some of the comments until the the push it call comes. God bless, safe travels, field. Thank you for the broadcast. Well, you're welcome from all three of us here and from Denise. Uh, Ryan W says, "Y'all take care." Yep, we're in the, the hands of God. Please take good care. There's the big red button. Thank you, Phil and Field. Nice chat today, and I learned some new things about Field, even though I've known him forever. That's from Agent Bean in Phoenix. Uh huh. Agent Bean, uh, I would tell you what her pastel prove it code is, but I can't remember if it's Jade Green or there's another one. 
And you know the other one too, the lady from Canada? Yes. Uh, okay, I got it figured out. Mint green and jade green. Okay, uh -huh. I still need the three, two, one, push it. And for people that say, I don't get the pastel colors, uh, well. Well, to all, to all of you out there that I have met and that I do know, Myself and Mary wish you a very, uh, um, very nice high. And uh, Mary, you can say hello to all of our friends. Hi, everyone. See, she's not always silent. 